الحمد لله رب العالمين لك الحمد يا ربنا كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك لك الحمد كله ولك الشكر كله وإليك يرجع الأمر كله على نيته وسره إنك على كل شيء قدير اللهم لك الحمد بأن خلقتنا وهديتنا ولك الحمد بأن جعلتنا من خير أمة أخرجت للناس ولك الحمد بأن هديتنا لمعالم دينك الذي ليس به التباس لك الحمد يا ربنا أن أنزلت إلينا أعظم رسول أنزل وأرسلت إلينا أفضل كتاب أرسل لك الحمد يا ربنا على أنعمك العظيمة وآلائك الجسيمة نحمدك يا ربنا ونشكرك ونستعين بك ونستهديك ونستغفرك ونثني عليك الخير كله ولا نكفرك نرجو رحمتك ونخشى عذابك إن عذابك الجد بالكفار ملحق وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وحبيبه بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في الله حق الجهاد حتى أتاه اليقين اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على الحبيب المصطفى محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اهتدى بهديه وعمل بعمله إلى يوم الدين وارضعنا معهم بفضلك وكرمك أرحم الراحمين اللهم آمين I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the creator of heavens and earth I thank Allah for the blessings that I know and the blessings that I do not I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for bringing me and my family and loved ones to this world for providing for us, for giving us sustenance and provision, for giving us knowledge and wisdom, for giving us a roof over our heads. I thank Allah for the air that we breathe, for the food that we eat, for the water that we drink. I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for wealth, for family, for security, for health. And above all, I thank Allah for bringing us to the fold of Islam. I express my gratitude to the Almighty in words and action. I bear witness that there's no deity in this universe worthy of worship, save Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is Allah's final prophet and messenger, the bearer of glad tidings, the torch of light, the role model to be followed, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I thank Allah for making us among the followers of Muhammad. And I thank Allah for the blessing that is Muhammad. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among the righteous followers of Muhammad. And to give us the strength to walk in the footsteps of Muhammad. And I ask Allah to extend His blessings upon the Prophet and his family, his companions, and all men and women that walk with strength and humility in their footsteps. And I ask Allah to make each and every one of us among them. Allahumma ameen. My dear brothers and sisters, I greet you with the greeting of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oftentimes you drive, especially in suburban areas, and you examine the names of the streets. Sometimes the names get really ridiculous, that you wonder sometimes on what basis they select street names. So I was walking recently uh, in a residential neighborhood up in El Dorado Hills, and I realized that most of the names sound Muslim or Arab. So there is Amr way, there is Hanan Court. Uh, there is uh, a lot of Arabic names you know, in, in that entire neighborhood. So I did a little research. And I realized that the developer of that area was a Palestinian guy himself. And he ended up naming most of the roads in the development that he created after his children and after his brothers and sisters. So you're driving around... You know, all these, all these Arab sounding names everywhere. And I said to myself, such a cool thing that the kid grows up and his dad named, named the street after him. Or a daughter grows up knowing that her father named a court or a boulevard or a street after her. And a thought occurred to me, naming a street after yourself is one important thing. But imagine if a city is named after you. 
You know, imagine if, uh, you know, like there is Lincoln up there very close to us. Imagine that there is a Muhammadville, for example, right? Or Abdullah town. It sounds far-fetched today, but maybe 50 years from, from today when there's a lot of, you know, prominent Muslims in this country, they'll, they'll start naming cities after us. I mean, you never know, right? Imagine if they named a country after your name. Does one country occur to us when we think of that? Saudi Arabia, for example. They named an entire country, millions of people, after one guy. I think that is all vain, right? I think it's all vain to name a street or to name a city or to name a country after you because you have money and wealth and power and you can actually do it. I think it's all vain, right? But what is not vain is when they name something after you be after you die because you've left an amazing legacy behind. So sometimes they would name a theater after one of the biggest donors. Or they would name uh, a library. Or they would name a building on campus at a university campus after one of the professors that have contributed to science and technology and died with honor and dignity. That I can understand. When you've lived a life of service and you've contributed greatly to society and you did not seek that kind of recognition, but when you passed away, society recognizes you and honors you by putting your name on something of prominence and importance, right? Now imagine that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala names a surah in the Quran after you. Imagine that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala names a surah in the Quran after you. يُسَمِّ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ سُورَةً مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ تُتْلَ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ عَلَى اسْمِكَ A Qur'an that will be recited until the day of judgment is named after you. After you've lived your life and you've contributed and you've honored and you've served and then you die. And history remembers you. And people remember you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remembers you that when he decides to send a prophet he takes one surah in the Qur'an and he names that surah after one particular individual. And that man is not a prophet, is not a messenger. That man was an extremely average person. He was poor, he was black, and he was a slave. He grew up in Africa, and he was a slave of a wise master who understood the type of people that he worked with. At a very young age, he demonstrated great signs of wisdom. His slave master one day asked him to slaughter a lamb. And he told him, go and get me from the lamb the best part. Slaughter the lamb and bring me the best part. So this young black slave brought the tongue and the heart. How many of you tasted the lamb tongue before? Kids growing up in this country, I was like, ew, disgusting. It's very good. It's very tasty. So he brought him the tongue, and he brought him the heart, and he said, This is the best part of the lamb. So the slave master scratched the back of his head, and he said, Okay, now I want you to go bring me the worst part of the lamb. Bring me the worst part of the lamb. So this boy, he goes and he comes back to his master and he brought what with him? He brought the tongue and the heart again. So he asked him, the tongue and the heart are the best part of the lamb. And the tongue and the heart also are the worst part of the lamb. And he says, yes. فَهَذَيْنِ these two things right there, when they are good, they are the most beautiful thing in this universe. The heart and the tongue. When they are clean and beautiful, they are the most beautiful thing in the universe. But when they are ugly, they become the worst thing in the universe. Same thing, right? But it depends on how you use your heart what types of feelings you harbor in your heart, and what kinds of words you say with your tongue. 
If you harbor positive feelings and you say good things, they become the most beautiful thing. And if you harbor ill feelings and evil feelings and jealousy and envy and hatred, and you say horrible things, they become the worst thing in the universe. Right? It's our hearts and it's our tongues. So the slave master was so impressed by this young black slave that he decided to free him. He says, you are free. Someone like you should not be a slave. And this young man decided to travel to the one place on earth that was so civilized, that was led by a remarkably just king. And he travels there hundreds of miles away, and he starts from scratch. He becomes a sweeper, he sweeps the streets, and he cleans the streets, and gradually rose up the ranks and was hired. He got a job as a gatekeeper at the king's palace. He became a guard at the king's palace. And after becoming a guard, he got a job inside the palace. And then he became the keeper of the king's chest where he keeps his weapons. And that particular king had a hobby. You know, every man has a job, but many of us also have hobbies that we do on the side. That particular king had... A very interesting hobby. He used to make shields. Shields of war. And this young slave from Africa had never seen a shield before. So he's sitting there and the king came to the place where they keep the weapons. And he's making a shield. And you know when you see something that you don't understand, you are burning with curiosity and you would like to ask. What is that? What, what are you doing over there? What is that thing? I've never seen anything like that before. But he decided to remain silent and to observe. Because brothers and sisters, sometimes you learn a lot by not saying anything. Instead of jumping the gun and asking tons and tons of questions. Maybe you'll get your answers in due time, but just wait. So he sat there for a few minutes and the king keeps making the shield. And when he was done, he held his shield and he looked at it with such pride. And he said to himself, what a beautiful shield of war this is. And that's when the young African slave thought to himself, Alhamdulillah, that I didn't ask anything. Because sometimes silence is the greatest manifestation of wisdom. As-samtu min al-hikmah. When he was saying that to himself, the king heard him. And he said to him, I was watching you and you are all curious and your eyes are you know, emanating with curiosity, but you didn't ask me any questions. And now you say, silence is wisdom, why? Tell me why. He says, you know, your majesty, had I asked you when you were making the shield, I would have interrupted you, maybe you would have gotten upset with me. But I just waited, and I got my answer, without having to ask or say anything. The king was so impressed with him, and he brought him a little bit closer. Now this young man in his, is in his 20s. And he became a very close advisor of the king of one of the most powerful countries in the world. Remember, he used to be poor, destitute, and a slave. Now he became an advisor to his majesty, the king. And one day, when he had not even turned 30 yet, the king decided to hire him as, as chief justice of the entire country. He's not even 30. And he was retained by the king as chief justice. And for the next 10 years... He does so well as chief justice and he impresses the king so much that when it was time for the king to prepare his own son, the crown prince, to take over the country, he was looking around for the last few years searching for a mentor that can help him with his son. A mentor that would teach him the deen, that would teach him Islam, that would teach him about God, about the world, that would teach him about values and principles and morals and ethics, and ethics, that would teach him about governance, that would teach him about fairness. So he kept looking and looking and looking and he couldn't find anyone to become his own son's tutor and mentor except this chief justice that started off as a slave from Africa. The country that that king ruled over is Palestine. And the king himself is King David, Dawood, And the crown prince, obviously, is 
Sulaiman alayhi salam. And the mentor of Sulaiman, the chief justice of the Israelites, was none but Luqman al-Hakim radiallahu anhu. Luqman alayhi salam. Why do we say radiallahu anhu sometimes and alayhi salam sometimes? Because Luqman was the only man that was given a choice between prophethood and wisdom. Allah Azza wa Jal khayyarahu bayna al-nubuwwati wal-hikmah. He gave him a choice between prophethood and wisdom. And while it's tempting to be a prophet, Luqman alayhi salam chose wisdom. And wisdom, hikmah, brothers and sisters, has nothing to do with education. Has nothing to do with your degrees and your certificates and your PhDs. Wisdom has to do with how you use your knowledge in everyday choice. Some people with the greatest degrees and they make the most horrible decisions. And some people are very simple with very little education, but they have wisdom that can be distributed upon the people of an entire country. And Luqman was one of those people. Luqman alayhi salam was hired and retained by Dawood to become the private tutor and the mentor of Sulaiman, the crown prince, the would-be king of the Israelites. And I wanted you to stop and think about that. He did not hire Luqman to become a general in the army. He did not hire him to become the secretary of the state or to become the, the minister of foreign affairs or to take care of the budget. Or He did not ask him to use his wisdom to manage the affairs of the country. Rather, he asked Luqman to use his wisdom to help him with his own son. Imagine that. A king with resources that can build schools for his son, not just hire a mentor. He could have built schools. He could have hired 25,000 different teachers. But he understood the basic simple fact that you and I cannot grow and become decent human beings without mentorship. If you think that I became as the imam became who I am today because of my own effort, you would be wrong and mistaken. I am who I am today because of my teachers. Teachers that my father hired and asked me to stay with and to stick with for so many years. And it wasn't always fun and it wasn't always exciting. I had to drag my feet to go attend my halaqah. And I had to stay up at night in order to finish memorizing my Quran because I don't want to be embarrassed in front of the other students. When my shaykh, when my teacher, you know, tests me on the material. I would rather play soccer or karate or get engaged in any other activity than go to my Sunday school. But growing up, I did not have a choice. Every single parent here, you have children. I am going to give it to you right now in plain terms. Okay? And I am not going to uh, make it look nice to you. I am not going to put makeup on the pig, as they say. Because the pig will still look ugly. I'm not going to put makeup on it. I'm going to tell it to you with absolute candor. If you have a child that is growing up in this country and your child is not consistently attending an Islamic program, your child will be corrupted. Your child one day will stray from the path and you will lose them. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. I have lived long enough to see with my own eyes. 15 years I have been an imam in this country. And I have seen kids that were four and five and six. And now they are in their 20s. And it is a consistent pattern. Children that attend Islamic programs, even if it's an hour or two a week, always fare better than children that do not. And I don't even care about the quality of the program. Yes, you're better off in a better quality program. But your son or your daughter in some program, and by the way, the same. I say the same to the children in this room. All the young people in this room, whether it's a halaqa or Sunday school or after school program or a mentorship program or someone that comes home in order to teach you the Quran, I know it is not exciting and fun all the time, but wallahi it'll come and save your life one day. It'll save your life one day. And you better sink your teeth and sink your claws in that knowledge that is coming to you because one day it'll come in handy, I guarantee it. And if you are not in any of those programs, the likelihood of you 
steer, st staying, straying so far from Islam is extremely high. I'm being honest with you because I've seen it with my own eyes over the years, time and time again. The pattern is clear and established. How many of you know Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, the great scholar? You don't have to raise your hands. Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, everyone knows him. Abu Hamid's real name is Muhammad, Muhammad al-Ghazali. His brother, Ahmed al-Ghazali. They were two brothers, very close in age. Muhammad became the great, famous Abu Hamid. Ahmed was also a great scholar, but not as famous as his brother Muhammad. Now the story of Abu Hamid, of Muhammad and Ahmed, is the same exact story of mentorship. Their father, before he died, wrote his will. And in his will, he basically said, okay, my land will be sold and distributed among my children. This, per this one is going to take this uh, percentage. That one is going to take that percentage, which is very important, by the way. You and I, if we don't write our wills and get our wills signed and taken care of by an attorney, the government is going to take 30 or 40% of your wealth when you leave this country. And money will be distributed in ways that are not Islamic amongst your children. But if you write your will today and get it ratified by an attorney, one of those probate attorneys, it'll save you tons of money in the event, God forbid, of your death, and it'll save your family a ton of pain and agony in the event of your death. So we have to write our wills. This is almost an Islamic obligation. But this interesting thing about the father of Ahmad and Muhammad is that in his will, he also wrote in another section something very strange. The science of hadith will be taught to my son by Sheikh so-and-so who lives on that street. And he would write the address. Tajweed, my son will learn tajweed with Sheikh so-and-so. And he would write the name and the address. The science of usul, history, seerah, fiqh, all of the different Islamic sciences. He actually wrote it down in his own will. And he contacted the shiuch and the scholars and the teachers. And he made them promise that in the event of his death, they will continue to become teachers of his own kids. So when he died, the elders of the town came together, and Muhammad and Ahmad were little kids. And they looked at their father's will, and he said, okay, uh, the, their hadith teacher is going to be so-and-so, let's go talk to him. Their Quran teacher is going to be so-and-so, let's go talk to him. And they secured all the teachers of little Ahmad and Muhammad, and they stayed with them until they grew up, and they became the great scholars that they became. You understand that? It doesn't happen by an act of God or a miracle. It happens through consistent and systematic effort. Dawood assigns Luqman to become the teacher and the mentor of his most important son, the crown prince, Sulaiman And that is why Sulaiman grew up and became Sulaiman that you and I know of, that the Quran says about him, وَفَهَّمْنَاهَا Sulaiman. We made Sulaiman aware. He is so smart and intelligent. He sees things and he understands what's beneath, what's underneath. The Bible call him, calls him King Solomon, right? In the Quran we call him Sulaiman. Dawood, David, same people. But that's what I wanted to emphasize to you, brothers and sisters, the idea of mentorship and the idea of education. Using our resources. It is so easy for our postmodern wealthy suburban parents to spend money on their kids a piano class. They spend money on their kids soccer or karate. We spend kids uh, money sending our kids to a robotics, uh, a robotics class. But how much money and time and effort are, and resources are we spending on our children? It's children's Islamic education. That's a very important question. You and I understand that no one is going to be able to learn piano without taking a teacher and spending years learning. You will never become a great soccer or karate player or basketball player until you, you know, are in leagues and, and championships for so many years. But why do we think that our children will become knowledgeable about Islam and will love the deen on their own? I really don't get it. I don't understand that. And the one thing, the one area in our lives that we expect it to happen for free is Islamic education. Everything else we need to pay for. But when it comes to Islamic education, it has to be free. Oh, that's too much. You pay the piano teacher $250 a month. But when it comes probably more. 
But when you are asked to pay your children hundred dollars a month, oh, that's that's too much. That's too much. Seriously, it's just Islam. What's the big deal? It's the biggest deal. That's the biggest deal. Your son may learn how to play baseball and become a great pianist, but will your son be with you in Jannah or not? Is that question important for me alone, or is it important for all of us? It has to be important for all of us. What good is it if I teach my children every all the skills in this dunya, and then I'm standing by the gates of Jannah and they're not with me? And I don't know where they are, they're gone. What good is that? Dawood السلام, invests in the Islamic education of his own son by retaining this great teacher, Luqman al-Hakim. The thing is though, and let me point your attention to something really interesting. There are so many stories about Luqman. So many stories about Luqman. Most of the stories come from the hadith, they come from Abdullah ibn Abbas, they come from legends that are derived from the Bible. But Luqman was mentioned in the Quran how many times? I mean, he's, there's a surah that is named after him, but he was mentioned in the Quran how many times? Once. And he was mentioned in the Quran in Surah Luqman in a very specific context when he was having a conversation with who? With his own son. Is it? Is that arbitrary or random? A great mentor and a great teacher that was the mentor of Sulaiman salam himself is only mentioned in the Quran in the context of him mentoring his own son. Do you think that's a coincidence? Of everything in Luqman's life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selects that incident and it's the only thing that he mentions. I mean, look at the other surah that is named after a prophet, Yusuf. I mean, surah Yusuf speaks of the life of Yusuf, every nitty gritty detail. From the time he was born, growing up, and falling in the pit, and being taken as a slave by the Egyptians, all of his life is mentioned in detail. But the life of Luqman salam is not mentioned. The only thing that is mentioned in Surah Luqman is a conversation that he was having with his own son. Remember those good old days when fathers were actually involved in raising their own children? Remember those days? Today fathers are not involved. Fathers work and make money. And rearing the children is not the responsibility of women. But in reality, both mom and dad are supposed to be raising the children and having conversations with the children and teaching the children and helping them learn and grow, right? So he's sitting there having quality time with his own son. Many narrations say that his son was seven, by the way. And if you look at the four or the five things that he said to his son in Surah Luqman, you will be stunned. And inshallah ta'ala, I will address those few things the conversation between Luqman and his son. Let me talk about that inshallah ta'ala in the second half of this khutbah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us our sins, to establish us with firmness on his path. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for our mistakes, for our weaknesses. Brothers and sisters, raise your hands and seek the forgive forgiveness of Allah azza wa jal. أدعو الله وأنتم موقنون بالإجابة. الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين به ونستهديه ونستغفره. ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وقائد الغر الميمين محمد الصادق الوعد الأمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ورضعنا معهم بفضلك وكرمك أرحم الراحمين اللهم آمين My dear brothers and sisters I talked to you about mentorship today. I talked to you about care that we need to give to our children. Uh, attention that has to be paid to their spiritual growth. And it just it doesn't happen on its own. We need to exert effort to find good and qualified teachers for our children. To put them in good and solid Islamic programs. Sometimes against their will. It doesn't have to be so much fun and the children need to come home and say, Oh, dad, mom, this was so amazing. I need to go there every day. It doesn't work like that every single time. There's so many distractions in this community, in this society. There is nothing that you can do at the masjid that will compete with social media and popular culture and songs and, and PlayStation 4. But we have to exert effort to make the programs as appealing as possible to the children. And to also make sure that we push them a little bit if we have to, right? And all the young people here, sometimes you just need to surrender and say, 
It may not be fun, but I need to do it because it's good for my future. It protects me from shaitan. One day, inshallah ta'ala, all this knowledge is going to come in handy and it will serve you, if not save your life outright. What are the things that Luqman spoke to his son about? You know, us fathers today, the, the, the farthest we can do when we talk to our kids, how was school today? Right? We really don't know what to say to the children anymore. There's no conversation. There's no common ground. How was school? Good. Okay, awesome. How was your day? Good. That's it. And then when the kids are talking to their own peers, they're having lengthy conversations. But when their dads are talking to them, the answers are usually just one word answers. There's something wrong about that. Luqman alayhi salam speaks to his, again, وَلَقَدْ أَتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةِ See? Wisdom. It's not a matter of knowledge. It's a matter of wisdom. We've given Luqman wisdom. Wisdom to know how to talk to children. So he starts by establishing the most important truth in this universe. And we have to say that to our children, even if they don't understand it. They may not understand it today, but they will understand it one day. Ya Bunaya, la tushrik billah. Do not ever take other entities in this universe and put them at the level of God. Do not take your video games and put them at the level of God. Do not consider Snapchat and Instagram to be at the level of God. Social media is not at the level of God. Your friends who will make fun of you if you don't dress like them, they're not God to judge you. This is the meaning of shirk. When you think that other people or other entities in this universe deserve similar attention compared to the attention that you have to afford Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. لا تشرك بالله. Do not allow any object in this universe to get in your heart and to fill your heart the way God is supposed to fill your heart. That's number one. That's the foundation. And if you think this is way too philosophical for the children, you're wrong. You have to talk to the kids about لا إله إلا الله and what it actually means. I'm not talking about someone going and worshipping a tree or a cow. Maybe in the ancient world they did that. We're talking about manifestations of shirk that exist today in our lives that we experience every single day. If you take God from someone, they're supposed to agonize. But if you take their Xbox from them, they'll commit suicide. If you take their best friend from them, they'll, they'll cry for two weeks. If you say no, they just want to organize a little gathering. Oh, can I attend this thing where my friends are going? And you say no to them. They're going to have a fit for the next two days. That's shirk. Forgive me for saying it's shirk. The kids practice that without noticing, but I really think it's shirk. Because you are taking a, an object and you are putting it at the level of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we need to tackle that as parents right away. And once you've established the value and the sanctity of God in their hearts, the second, and the message here is to all the young people here, the second item that has to be on top of your priorities is your parents. We admonish the human beings to take care of their parents, to honor their parents. Not to just blindly obey their parents, but to listen to their parents. And to show compassion to their parents. Show empathy to their parents. Remember when we were kids and our parents used to say, you can't even say, oof, oh, whatever. Even saying something like this would make you deserving of God's punishment. There's a hadith that I heard once that really shook me to the foundations. And the Prophet says, Inni bari'un mimman ahadda nazara ila walidayh. إِنِّي بَرِيءٌ مِمَّنْ أَحَدَّ النَّظَرَ إِلَىٰ وَالِدَيْهِ I dust my hands off, I will have nothing to do on the day of judgment from someone who stares at his parents in a mean way. Just staring at your parents. In a mean way, in a disrespectful manner. The Prophet ﷺ will have nothing to do with you on the day of judgment. لَا يَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةَ عَاقْ حَتَّى يُقْطَى بَيْنَ الْخَلَائِقِ the one who disrespects his parents will never enter Jannah until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides in the affairs of all of human beings. So you're just going to stand on the side like you're on time out. You're just going to be standing there for a few million years waiting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to decide in the affairs of all the creation. Remember Ashab al-A'raf, people whose good deeds and bad deeds are equal on the scale, you're going to be standing with them if you disrespect your parents. 
And whether or not eventually you go to Jannah, that'll be entirely up to Allah Azza wa It's the pain of waiting. And you're going to be waiting for so long. You establish the, the oneness of Allah. And then you establish respect to your parents. And right after that, we start talking about God consciousness. Ya bunayya innaha in takum mithqala habbatim min khardil. Fatakum fi sakhratin aw fi samawati aw fi al-ardi yati biha Allah. He took his son on a field trip. And they were looking for a mustard seed. Mustard seed is very, very small. And the son kept looking and looking and looking until he flipped a rock ups, upside down and he saw a little mustard seed underneath, hidden under the rock. And he said to his son, my son, listen, there isn't a mustard seed that can hide anywhere in this entire universe that Allah cannot see. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has account of it. So you build God consciousness in the heart of our children, right? That's number three. And once we are done with these foundational matters, now we start talking about salah. Many parents, all they want is to see their kids praying and memorizing Quran. That's it. With no foundation whatsoever. With no good hearts or good minds whatsoever. With no hikmah. There's no wisdom. Ya bunayya, aqim salah. That comes after. We've established all that. Now let's establish prayer. وَأْمُرْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَانْهَا عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا أَصَابَ Become a good force in your community, in your society. If you see your friends at school doing something wrong, don't be shy, talk to them. Enjoy what is right and forbid what is wrong. And they will attack you and make fun of you. You know what? Be patient. اصبر عَلَى مَا أَصَابَ إِنَّ ذَلِكَ لَمِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ Indeed, this is difficult, but something that you still have to do. وَلَا تُصَعِّرْ خَدَّكَ لِلنَّاسِ now the fifth category is akhlaq, morals. Do not act arrogantly among people. Do not think you're better than them because you are white or black or Pakistani or Arab. Do not think you're better than them because you're a better Muslim because you come to the masjid and I memorize the Quran. No. لا تصعب خدك للناس. Don't walk around with arrogance like this, elevating your cheek. ولا تمشي في الأرض مرحة. Don't walk the earth with arrogance, thinking that you're all that. My dad is wealthy. My dad has this and we live in that place. And that gives me the right to act arrogantly. We're talking to seven and eight year olds, by the way. And we're telling our children, don't be arrogant, be humble. وَلَا تُصَعِرْ خَدَّكَ لِلنَّاسِ وَلَا تَمْشِ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَةً إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ كُلَّ مُخْتَالٍ فَخُورٍ Allah does not love people like that. You establish the akhlaq of our children. So once we establish Allah and His oneness, and we establish our love and respect and affection for our parents, and we talk about consciousness of God, Allah sees you everywhere. Establish our prayers, give advice to our friends, and act with humility and refrain from arrogance, then you have a humble, well-rounded human being. That, brothers and sisters, is wisdom. That is the meaning of hikmah. And I'm glad that on Veterans Day, we have a lot of families, we have a lot of children coming. And I hope, inshallah ta'ala, that this will be a conversation starter. The khutbah is not supposed to provide you with everything you need. The khutbah scratches the surface. It's a conversation starter, so when we take our kids home, we talk about, oh, the imam talked about this, what do you think? What is your perspective? What is your opinion on this idea and that matter? And this is how we engage in conversations that will leave a lasting impact on the heart. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our good deeds, to forgive our sins, to establish us with firmness on His path, to fill our hearts with His love, with the love of the Messenger وسلم, with the love of the Qur'an and the love of the deen. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make tawheed strong and clear in our hearts. I ask Allah azza wa jal to refine our moral character, to uh, purify our hearts and souls. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to make us among those who walk the earth in humility and to fill our hearts and our lives with wisdom. Allahumma ameen. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen our brothers and sisters that suffer anywhere in the world from tyranny, from poverty, from illness and disease. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us catalysts of good. In their lives, Amin, Amin, Amin. اللهم لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم. بارك لنا في أولادنا وأهلنا يا رب العالمين. اللهم احفظ لنا أولادنا. اللهم احفظ لنا أولادنا وبارك فيهم. 
واملا قلوبهم بنور الايمان يا رب العالمين حببهم فيك وفي نبيك وفي دينك وفي قرانك اللهم املا قلوبهم بحب الصلاه والصيام والعباده اللهم قربهم منك يا رب العالمين واكلهم بعينك التي لا تنام واحفظهم بحفظك الذي لا يضام اللهم يا ربنا اجمعنا بهم على خير عند ابواب الجنه يا رب العالمين اللهم ادخلنا الجنه في زمره النبي المصطفى العدنان برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات المسلمين والمسلمات الاحياء منهم والاموات انك سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات يا رب العالمين واقم الصلاه ان الصلاه كانت على المؤمنين كتاب موقوتا